So today's talk is not Dave talking about credential sharing because he had an unfortunate medical problem. Uh, so we all wish Dave a, a speedy recovery. Uh, instead, we have a Mr. Eric Allman, uh, and he'll be talking about lessons learned from SendMail. Okay, um, hi all. Um, I'm back at UC Berkeley, and that's about all I have to say here. But I do have a few disclaimers. First of all, please be kind to me. Um, I started writing this talk at 6 this morning, and I finished it about, well, I'm not even sure I finished it a couple minutes ago. Um, I also apologize, this is a BSD conference. There's nothing specifically BSD-ish about this, although um, there were some other platforms that SendMail ran on. <laughs> Uh, and I haven't worked on SendMail in years. Uh, you know, sometimes it's time to move on, and I have moved on, um, so a lot of this is from memory. So just some background. Um, send, send mail, or actually deliver mail, before it originated on Unix 6th edition um, on a PDP-11 64-bit address space. I was working on the Ingress Relational Database Management System. It was uh, one of the two first relational databases ever implemented. So, you know, pre-Oracle, pre-SQL, pre-everything. Uh, but uh, to our blessing and curse, we got an ARPANET connection, and uh, everyone in the department wanted access to the ARPANET, and that was a problem. Um, so these are the days of, of uh, network wars. There was, of course, the ARPANET. There was BerkNet, which was a local network at Berkeley. Um, there was the UECP network, which you may well have heard of. There was CSNet, which you probably haven't heard of, PurdueNet, DECnet, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, It was very uh, ad hoc and um, highly heterogeneous. Um, Deliver Mail was uh, the very first instance of the mail routing. Uh, some people have claimed anywhere ever. I'm not sure that that's true, but. Um, I might have a valid claim to have invented the concept of internet mail, or inter lowercase i, internet mail. Um, it was routing only, there was no header rewriting, uh, there was no queue because everything I was using already had its own queue, there was no state, there was no d DSN's delivery status notifications, these are the messages saying, oh, I'm sorry I couldn't deliver the mail. So you either got an immediate status or none at all. Uh, the configuration was compiled in, etc. It was very, very basic, but yeah, I, it was quick to do. Now, I ask you now, what do you do with an address like UCBVAX colon research bang, DECVAX bang, world colon colon foo at Berkeley? This was a real address at the time. In fact, an entire book was put out <laughs> that had nothing except if you are here and want to get the mail there, look to page 386 and we'll tell you how. <laughs> um, I will point out, by the way, this was the origin of the exits.h file because uh, Deliver Mail wanted to get at least a few bits of status uh, and syslog, uh, which a lot of people don't realize was written as a part of the SendMail project. Um, also, uh, Warner yesterday mentioned MPX files. I just thought I'd point out that uh, at least one person outside of Bell Labs used MPX files. That would be me, and it was for syslog because there were no concepts of name pipes or anything like that. It was the only way I could get multiple programs to flow into one, or at least that I figured out. So 4.2 BSD comes along, or actually CSRG comes along, and 4 BSD. 0.2 BSD came out, and the internet. Berkeley got a DARPA contract to produce the platform for the internet, and that led to sockets and all the other stuff that you know about, but one of the things they needed was a, uh, a mail transfer agent to you know, get the mail from here to there. And Winge, um, uh, Bill Joy, uh, came to me and said, you know more about email than anyone else here, so why don't you do this? And um, except he said, 
you can't use the name deliver mail because it doesn't actually deliver any mail. And he was right about that. He didn't like send mail either, but I got that through. And so, you know, I went, okay, you know, need some new protocols. How hard can this be? Uh, answer is way, way harder than I thought. It required stuff like persistent state, uh, notably queues, but not merely queues. Uh, long-lived daemon uh, header rewriting, so you could avoid those nasty uh, formats that you saw before, delivery status no notifications, etc. It's an ongoing list. Mistake number one was I tried to maintain the PDP-11 uh, compatibility, because PDP-11s weren't going to go away anytime soon, and in retrospect, I probably should have just said, you know, deliver mail will survive on PDP-11s, they're going to go away eventually and whatnot. But at that point, 32 bits was, like, we couldn't even figure out what to do with 32 bits of address space, if you can believe that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, it seemed like, well, this is way off in the future yet. The top priority was reliable delivery. Um, deliver mail uh, did pretty well. Um, given what it had to work with, but uh, some of the other programs that it used, like the UCP agent and the Berknet agent and so forth and so on, um, weren't always as reliable as they might want to be, and I can assure you hell hath no fury like a professor whose grant um, proposal was lost in the mail. Yes, this has happened. And uh, by the way, did I mention, by the way, SendMail was not my job. I was working on the Ingress project. I'm just doing database systems, not mail systems. So this was a nights and weekends project. Uh, part of the effect of this, by the way, was uh, I had to like, reuse absolutely everything I possibly could because there was no way I could implement everything in the mail system. There's a place called MMDF out of, or a system called MMDF out of Delaware that did try to uh, re-implement everything. They probably did a cleaner design than SendMail. Uh, they got a million dollars to do that, SendMail won, with a guy working nights and weekends. I think there's a lesson there. So a brief history. Um, as I said, I wrote SendMail when I was a student and staff at Berkeley. Um, that was uh, SendMail version 5. I went to a startup, another database company called Britton Lee, and walked away from SendMail. I figured, you know, it's an adolescent now, it needs to go learn how to grow up in the world. Um, that analogy may have been way more accurate than I thought at the time. Um, SendMail splintered. Uh, every vendor had their own version, uh, slightly different syntaxes, slightly different semantics. Um, and plus there was uh, IDA out of um, Sweden, I can't remember exactly where. And uh, Paul Vixie, who I saw sitting around here, did uh, KJS, King James send mails, an attempt to unify them all. Um, <laughs> well, Paul, Paul did some great job. There were several others. Um, I returned to Berkeley on the Mammoth Project, at this point doing infrastructure to support research. And uh, one of the things was centralizing things because at that point every research project was running their own system, uh, their own mail server, their own, doing their own system administration, most of it badly. Uh, so we were trying to fix that problem. And in particular, uh, instead of having everyone's email go specifically to their workstation, we wanted them to go to a centralized mail server and uh, I had to get into SendMail. And as, when I started doing that, I quickly found myself drawn back in, and I started merging versions uh, using ideas here and there, and that ended up being version 8. Um, I left Berkeley again. Um, I had a totally disastrous job. I went off and I licked my wounds for a while, and then I co-founded SendMail Inc., and so I can't seem to get away from SendMail, maybe this time. Uh, I left there after 13 years, and ultimately I've ended up back at Berkeley, where I am now. <laughs> so about standards. One of my favorite topics, not. The standards at the time were rudimentary at best, uh, as in I tried to find out how 
email was sent on the ARPANET, and it was not written down. It was all word of mouth. Um, or you could look at the code, which took a while. It turns out it was part of FTP. Nobody bothered, I wasn't looking at FTP, but um, what standards were there were still in development. Um, they were often, uh, in fact, more often than not, they were ambiguous. Uh, in a lot of cases, I got yelled at for not following the standards, and it turns out I had just misinterpreted them because there were multiple ways to interpret the same standard. Uh, and the standards were undergoing a lot of revision for the internet. In many cases, they changed um, literally overnight. And um, so one of my successes, I think, was rewriting rules, at least as a concept, which people have said, oh, you know, that's absurd. But when these changes in standards came out, I could usually have them implemented by the next morning. So I would literally go home do the latest round of revisions and send it out that night. Um, it, one of my philosophies uh, has been, still is, sort of, mostly, that sometimes it's easier to solve a general problem than a specific problem, and this was an example of that. The syntax, on the other hand, I probably could have done a better job. <laughs> you know, it's fine when config files were, you know, a dozen or so lines long and whatnot, but um, when they got to, you know, tens, hundreds of lines, um, I'll talk more about this later. Um, by the way, the, the thing of this, the, oh, surely the standard stabilized, the internet was up and running and so forth. No, a few years later, uh, the drums working group came along to revise all of it, and I went back to my thing of you know, doing stuff nightly uh, and so forth. So standards change, um, they're mutable. Um, and uh, I will say the IETF process around uh, messaging standards in particular leaves a little something to be desired. Um, I stopped going to the IETF after I walked out of a meeting one time and discovered I had a knife in my back, and uh, that was the last meeting I ever went to. So, rewriting rules. Well, some mistakes were made. Tabs. I get so much shit about tabs. <laughs> so I stole the idea from Make. Um, Stu Feldman, um, you know, I said, well, if it's good enough for Make, and, you know, Stu's obviously smarter than I am, and so forth and so on, um, then surely it's good enough for SendMail. Uh, he said it was the biggest mistake he made in Make. Uh, even worse than dollar less than, dollar at, the, the totally non-mnemonic things. Uh, Stu explained to me that he, there were some things that Make wouldn't do, and he went in one night, he was one of these people who came in at you know, six o'clock and worked all through the night and then went home at you know, four in the morning kind of thing. And he did this and he, threw this stuff in, and he didn't have time to think about something rational, so he just put it in um, and picked random characters. I'll go back and I'll fix it tomorrow. And by the time he got back, uh, Ken had done a distribution of Unix, which, as you heard from <laughs> Warner, was a casual thing at best. And so Stu said, oh, it's too late to change it. Um, Did you know which one? No. Sorry, I, I could ask Stu, he might remember. Uh, so, lesson here, don't blindly follow the pack. <laughs> um, it was a pretty obscure syntax. Once again, it was okay when they were small, but it got more obscure with time. I mean, what are you going to do with that? I mean, I can tell you what that does. Now, imagine a hundred lines of that. And, uh, you know, I look at config files now and I go cross-eyed. Um, one of the things was, uh, part of it that was the 16-bit legacy, uh, didn't have a lot of extra memory for parsing and things, and um, partially just 
laziness, simplicity. So everything was single letter, macro names, option names, um, so forth. That ultimately did get fixed, but it was a painful process and it could have been avoided. Uh, at one point, I actually literally looked at the config file. Um, real, I think I actually printed it out on paper, which was the first time I'd seen more than 24 lines of it at any one time, and uh, was fairly horrified, but it was running on a whole bunch of machines on campus, some of which were in the computer center, and getting them to do anything was a pain, and so I just said, fine, I'm stuck with it. Um, I could have done better. Um, you know, support would be so much easier without the users. <laughs> uh, <laughs> One of my mistakes was letting my installed base cripple me. Um, compare this to, for example, uh, the C language. Um, I first started using C right around during the transition from version 4 to version 5. So I used version 4 a little teeny bit. I uh, didn't get to, uh, when I got to Angris, I started using version 5. But the language changed between those two versions because Dennis, you know, looked at it and said, you know, we can do this better. And then I remember very distinctly the version 5 to version 6 transition for Ingress where we basically had to go through the entire code base, which was fairly significant at that point, and move to a subtly new language. And then guess what? We got to do it again when version 7 came out. And, you know, at the time I was like, is this really necessary and so forth, but I think part of the reason C is such a beautifully clean language is precisely because Dennis came along and said, no, that's wrong, I'm going to fix it, and people will get used to it. Um, you know, I was concerned about a dozen sites, even a hundred sites. I think tens of millions of sites. I had no idea it was going to be anything like that, and uh, I probably should have, should have shot a little higher than I actually did. <laughs> um, I should have been willing to change more things. One of my great regrets is that in the view that I didn't want to screw up existing users, I would not change defaults in the configuration file because then it might change the, you know, they get a new release and it would start to behave differently and I didn't want that. The effect was that anyone installing something new in order to get reasonable defaults had to go in and manually put in all this stuff in the configuration file and looking back on it, I can only kick myself. It was an incredibly stupid idea. I, I did it with the best of intentions, but it was wrong and I should have just taken, you know, the Dennis's approach and said, they'll get used to it, um, do the right thing. Uh, but I do want to warn you, um, you know, be careful of blindly following, you know, new trends. Legacy really does matter. You don't want to, like, arbitrarily leave your uh, users out hanging in the wind. And, uh, you know, those shiny things, they look so shiny right now, but they corrode and the shiny bits start to flake off and, you know, so forth. Oh, oh squirrel! <laughs> Starting a company. This isn't really relevant to the whole thing, but I thought I'd throw it in. I started SendMail in an attempt to uh, get back to uh, coding because I was spending all of my time basically doing support, most of which was reading emails saying, look at the FAC, question number, you know, 17, da da da, and that was taking literally all of the time I had for SendMail, and I wanted to move SendMail forward. So I thought, if I had a company, uh, you know, I can hire some support people, they can deal with all of this stuff, and I'll get to go do the fun stuff. Um, I am glad I did that. Um, I learned a lot. SendMail was one of the very first sort of hybrid, open, proprietary um, source companies. Um, it was totally new ground. We made some mistakes, but uh, a lot of what we did is still the basis for the way these companies work today. 
um, we're the ones with the arrows in our back, you know. Um, it was quite a roller coaster ride, um, very exciting at some times, uh, very uh, sad at other times. We, I got to ride the heady part of the internet bubble rising up. We went from two people to 200 people in, what, two years, something like that, three years maybe. Um, but on the other hand, we also got to ride the other end of the bubble down, and that was no sudden. We went from 200 people to 80 even more quickly than we went up. Uh, but we did survive, uh, which made us better than a lot of the folks out there. Um, yeah, sorry, we had offices all over the U.S. and, you know, the U.K. I got a lot of frequent flyer miles back then frequent flyer miles. You may notice you don't get a lot of coding done on airplanes. I was a complete failure on my goal. I never did really get back to coding. I didn't realize that my role was going to be, you know, the trained monkey being taken into customer sites. You know, you're so special, we've got Eric Ullman himself for you to visit with. <laughs> I'm sitting there trying to remember not to pick my nose. <laughs> So I basically didn't do any coding for a decade. It was hard to get back to it, I have to admit. Um, the other thing is it really tied my hands regarding technical decisions at times. Companies talk a lot about innovation, uh, but at the same time, companies are very risk averse. And getting the balance between those things is uh, really, really hard. And uh, there were definitely some things I wanted to do with SendMail and I was told that did not fit into the product schedule. Um, I do have an entire talk, it's a little old right now, I'd have to update it, but you know, I think it's called, So You Want to Start a Company. So, some random other observations, how am I doing on time? You, it is uh, 11.50, you have 25 minutes. Oh God, I've got tons of time, okay. Um, some other random observations, this is about code, both good and bad. Um, People have said, why did you use M4? Well, you know, answer number one is because it was there. And actually people, M4 has a, a bad rep, but it's actually a really pretty cool language. You can do an awful lot with it. Um, it's a little confusing at times, I admit, but um, the first attempt to do it was essentially a procedural thing. Just okay, take this snippet of code and plug it in here and so forth. So it's just a very simple macro language. Um, that failed miserably because ultimately it was just syntactic sugar. Um, then I made a second attempt with uh, a more declarative style. I want this feature in, add whatever bits of code you need in order to make that feature work. Um, that was um, mixed success, I think. I would say. Um, most, it was certainly better than what we had before, and it was better than raw config files. And beyond that, I really have never quite decided on my own. I was a little OCD back then. I'm actually still a little OCD. Uh, and I spent way too much time trying to tweak the M4 so the output of M4 was pretty. And I should have realized that, no, if the M4 was successful, the output was assembly language, maybe even binary code. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, it was not worth it. And I literally, I can't imagine how much time I wasted doing that. It's I'm sorry. <laughs> um, putting all the functionality into one binary, there was a time when that was really convenient because I didn't have to worry about breaking stuff out into libraries and so forth. There would have been a lot of replication. But no, it, that, was, that was a mistake. I got some stuff out of it, but not that much. Uh, I did pretty extensive wrapping, um, you know, between Ingress and SendMail, I learned a lot about portability, more in SendMail than in Ingress. And um, to this day, I still write portable code for uh, 
everything, even stuff that I never anticipate to run on more than you know a Raspberry Pi in my basement. Um, but uh, one of the things I did was I wrapped a lot of things uh, inside other code so that I could come back and tweak the code later. The project I'm working on right now at Berkeley, for example, I've got a library that, um, among other things, all of the um, uh, threading primitives, you know, mutexes and so forth are, I don't use pthreads directly, I call a routine which calls pthreads. That has allowed me to do things like add debugging in when I really needed it, which you can't get out of pthreads and so forth. So I tend to put a layer around just about everything I use in the standard library. Um, you know, that, that does make my code very idiomatic, but so be it. One of the things that SendMail does, I don't know how many of you have actually looked at the code, but internally uh, it uses fork without exec to do memory management. So it was basically poor man's threads. Um, not quite threads because you're running in a separate address space. Um, you know, together with a memory management thing, we had a, a great way of backing out the stack. It was called exit. And, um, you know, that actually worked pretty well. Uh, uh, fork exec, I mean, the obvious thing to do it is you invoke a new something or other and so forth, but then I would have had to, had to reread the configuration file, I would have had to reread all the state and so forth. I would say on the whole, even though that was very weird and did create some problems at times, particularly when other people, other operating systems that called themselves Unix decided to change the semantics of fork. And that got me into trouble a few times, but I thought of that as their problem, not mine. Um, so, uh, mostly I think that was a good idea. Um, <coughs> moving to the design space, um, I, as I mentioned before, I leveraged everything I possibly could. There was no way that I could re-implement the entire world, and I'm really glad I did that. Uh, one thing I didn't mention earlier, but in the early days, particularly in version six, um, people had a way of customizing their sites. And customizing their sites included such things as changing the format of etc. password. Um, and so, uh, if, when you, and remember this was before get pw name, so you had no wrapper around it. The way you read the password file was you said open etc. password read, and you parsed from there. Um, by leveraging everything, if some site went in and said, okay, I'm going to change etc. password, anything that had to actually read the password file was localized into bin mail. And I didn't have to worry about that. And I can't tell you how much um, pain that uh, saved me. Um, with Ingress, we actually did get into this thing, which is why I didn't do it in SendMail. Steal from the best. Um, you know, there's no shame in using other people's ideas. Uh, the work that was done in IDA and KJS um, were, uh, uh, was, you know, instrumental. SunOS, believe it or not, did some good stuff. Uh, although I did tend to take uh, any ideas and generalize them. So IDA had the concept of database maps using the DB, uh, sorry, DBM, software, I turned that into a generic mapping thing where you could define new types and use that for a whole bunch of things. Um, yeah, okay, that's the same thing. Um, you know, encourage outside innovation uh, whenever possible. Um, I, I did not do this as well as I should have. Uh, we did, uh, at, at SendMail Inc., we added the Milter interface, which is a way for people to do mail filtering outside um, the actual MTA, uh, which uh, created a lot of innovation right there. You know, I mentioned earlier that the priority number one on mail was reliable delivery, and that's where it started. And by the time I left SendMail, the priority was 
throwing away as much email as absolutely possible. <laughs> and uh, frankly, I find that kind of discouraging, but there it is. Um, and by the way, I don't hate threading, even if I didn't use it in SendMail. The milters could be threaded if they wanted to be. They could, you know, run event-driven or threaded. Um, don't let yourself get too caught in the past. Um, you know, I definitely failed on that in a few places. There were times when I should have gone in and said, you know, this really sucks. I should just re-implement it. And part of it was I didn't have enough time, but I probably wasted more time maintaining the old stuff than I would have spent if I had just gone back and done it over. Uh, of course, those are value judgments you never know in advance. And that's what I've got. Any questions? Oh, and I think I'm supposed to ask you to use the mic, and I see Paul is going to come up and harass me. <laughs> They're applauding you, Paul. <laughs> Close to the mic. Okay. Um, that was great. I knew most of that from living it with you, but um, there are two things I'd love to hear your perspective on. Um, Frozen config files. Oh, I forgot all about those. <laughs> oh. And uh, I'll sit down for this, but um, I want to say we just edited the binary output uh, of M4 and stopped using it immediately. And by we, I mean most of the people who used SendMail were not able to change the M4 source stuff to do what we wanted, so we ended up hacking the config and then deleting the M4. Now, I now realize that if you had used popen, called M4 in real time when reading the config file so there we could not see the binary code, we would have had to do what you wanted. Bastard, you waited all this time <laughs> to tell me this. <laughs> Okay, um, enough of that one. Uh, frozen config files. Um, that was a technique that was used by um, some places. Uh, so frozen config files, I should explain. Um, since it was fairly uh, difficult to read in the configuration files and parse all of them and build the internal memory structure, and you wanted startup to be as fast as possible when it was running in kind of interactive mode because you could just pipe things to send mail and it would uh, deliver it off into, you know, wherever. Um, so a couple of programs back then used this idea of you read in your configuration file and then you write out data space um, to another file called the frozen configuration. And when you start up, you just read data space over on top so you've got all the same information. Of course, if the binary changes even a tiny bit, then things like pointers now point off into Never Never Land. And, um, you know, it at some point became pretty clear that that was way more, causing way more trouble than it was solving. And so they got dumped entirely. Um, certainly, if I understood the implications of it, I never would have wasted the time putting it in in the first place. I mean, it was actually kind of fun to do and, you know, neat concept. Oh, my God, this actually works? Except, of course, it didn't. <laughs> uh, so other than that, any other questions? As someone that's been fortunate enough to avoid SendMail, I was wondering if you could go back uh, to the slide where you had that configuration of uh, characters and just explain a little bit about what each of them is doing. <laughs> the rewrite that's a simple one. Yes. <laughs> Probably somewhere. Okay, this we need a trigger warning here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this may cause some people undue distress. <laughs> um, so the first letter of the line told you what the semantics of the line were. R was rewrite. Um, so it's a rewriting rule. It still is. It still is. <laughs> it still is. <laughs> 
dollar plus matches, uh, so SendMail first takes the address, it breaks it up into tokens, standard compiling technique. I'd taken a compiler class too. Uh, <laughs> and by the way, the, the, the whole rule set thing, it's just a simple production system, um, comes straight out of expert systems. I had taken an AI class. Uh, and, you know, a friend of mine who was a mathematician um, who said she really avoided send mail because she'd heard all these terrible things about it, and she finally couldn't put it off anymore, and she ended up taking the manual home, and she reads it, and she goes, what's everyone so upset about it? It's just a simple production system. <laughs> so it turns out if you're a mathematician, it's no problem. <laughs> so dollar plus matches um, one or more tokens. Dollar star matches zero or more. <clears throat> Um, the at sign matches an at sign. Um, dollar equal W matches any single word in the class um, equal or in class W, which later got changed into any sequence of words in the class W because that semantics turned out to be a little wrong. And if you do match that, then replace it by dollar one, which is the dollar plus an at sign, which is an at sign, and $D, which is a macro, which happens to be the local domain name. So this is a way you'd take arbitrary things that might match your um, local domain and turn it into a canonical format. That's all it is. <laughs> and, Oh, good. <laughs> Postfix, was it a blessing or? You know, um, I really like Vitsa. Uh, and when he was working on Postfix, um, he spent a lot of time, he looked through SendMail code a lot, uh, sp spent a fair amount of time interacting with him. He'd, you know, why did you do it this way? Um, you know, I would justify it as best I could. Uh, a couple times he found bugs and fed them back to me. Um, Postfix took a long time to write. And I remember I was at a conference at one point and there was some talk, it was one of these things with you know a massive room so you could actually sit in back and Pizza was sitting back there and in the dark and I sat down next to him and I sort of leaned over and I said, uh, so uh, how's the mailer going? And he looked at me and he went, it's an exercise in humility. <laughs> uh, Vitsa, like me, discovered it's a lot harder than it looks. Um, that said, he didn't start with a 16-bit legacy. Um, he had a lot more to work with. Uh, the, that mishmash of, of random special characters pretty much doesn't work anymore. We, the whole world has pretty much decided that user at domain <coughs> is good enough for everyone, uh, which was most emphatically not the case when I was doing rewriting rules. Rewriting rules were specifically because everyone wanted a different way of interpreting email addresses. Um, and now, you know, he did not have to deal with that legacy. I'm actually, people go, well, you know, aren't you ashamed of SendMail, you know, da-da-da. No, I'm proud of SendMail. It was born into a specific niche in the world. It did a really, really good job of, of filling out that niche. Uh, it's really, really good that the world isn't like that anymore and that we have some sense of sanity, and that makes a lot of things easier notably parsing of addresses. <laughs> um, the other thing was, um, uh, you know, again, partially because of the legacy, <clears throat> um, you know, started send mail in the day before sockets were existed, certainly named pipes. And so the idea of having arbitrary processes starting up communicating with each other could be done, but it was really hard to do. And so pretty much everything had to have a common um, uh, antecedent so you could create an unnamed pipe and then pass the file descriptors down the tree. Um, and that limited a lot of what you could do. Um, so 
Vita had a lot of advantages, but you know, he did an exceptionally good job, I think. And, you know, it's good work, what can I say? The one I cannot quite understand, and maybe I shouldn't say this on tape, is why Exum has continued to be so successful when it has all the architectural flaws that SendMail does. The only thing is it, uh, it's easier to configure because it attempts to do less. And, um, you know, I totally get why somebody might want a uh, postfix-like architecture. That makes total sense to me. Um, hi, Eric. Hi. Uh, the first time we met in 2011, I, pr I, I walked up to you and I said, hi, uh, my name is Des. I used to use SendMail, but I got better. And I would like to publicly apologize for that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Plus sign in the local part, curse or blessing? Oh, plus sign in the local part. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, this actually came out of the Andrew project at CMU. Um, the idea was that if I, my login name is Eric, which it is, um, you could have an arbitrary number of addresses that were Eric plus some other tag and you could use that for things like mail sorting and so forth. I still use this. I actually don't use the same syntax now because, um, you know, because I run my own mail server, I can just say everything at something in this domain is um, effectively Eric at the, the uh, original name. Uh, I do that because there's a surprising number of sites that think that plus is not a legal, you know, valid character in a username, which it is. Um, and I just got tired of dealing with those epox on them. Um, generally speaking, you know, I, for example, have a different email address for pretty much everyone I give my uh, address out to. So if I get something that claims to be from my bank, which is not to the address that I know my bank has, I know a priori that it is a fake. And this happens surprisingly often. Now, most of the time, the fakes are so bad that you would never believe that they were actually from your bank. But occasionally, you know, you get one where it's like, huh, looks plausible, but it's to the wrong address, so I'm done. I, you know, I don't know if plus is the right syntax, but I think the concept is a great one. And once again, I just stole the syntax, not my creation at all. Any other questions? So what, kind of, what kind of user agent are you using right now? <laughs> user agents. Um, I am currently using Thunderbird. Um, there are days I curse it. Um, I was cursing it day before yesterday when it suddenly decided that it needed to take up 100% of my CPU and after an hour it was still using up 100% of my CPU and my fan was running crazy and it was sitting on my lap and I was getting burns on my legs and um, you know I have absolutely no idea why. No clue. Apparently, Thunderbird just likes to do that occasionally. But, you know, I've got it, you know, my fingers are programmed with all the hotkeys and so forth, so it's really kind of hard to convince myself to go to something else. And I've looked at other things, including commercial products, and um, basically everything out there is bad. So. <laughs> okay. I guess that's it. Thank you. So thank you very much for stepping in at the last moment. We have a small token of oh, our appreciation you. and your timing is perfect.